One of the things that you said early on when you founded Neuralink, which has been amazing, congratulations on that. I wouldn't put words in your mouth, but I would say it would be more along the lines, if you can't beat them, join them when it comes to merging the neocortex and the cloud. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm just curious what your thoughts are about what's driving that. I mean, adding, adding that additional computational capacity and sensory capacity to the neocortex. Yeah, this is actually something that in Banks in the culture books, which I really recommend everyone read, in the culture books, there's something called a neural lace. So all the humans have this neural lace that's essentially a high bandwidth brain to computer interface. And in the, in the, at least in the culture books, it, the, it's so good that it actually retains all of your memories and kind of brain state. So even if your physical body dies, you can kind of be incorporated in another physical body and retain pretty much your original memories and brain state. I think it's a long way from that. We only just had our first neural link in a human, which is going, it's going quite well. The, uh, the first patient is actually able to control their computer just by thinking. But like this first, the first product we call telepathy, where you can control your computer and phone and through your computer and phone almost anything, just by thinking. You just lie there and think and you can move the, the, the mouse cursor around the screen. The patient has agreed to do sort of, I think a live demo of just, it is part quadriplegic where he literally is just controlling the, the, the screen. He can like play video games, download software, like really anything you can do with a mouse, just by thinking, which is pretty wild. It is pretty wild. I should say there's a long way to go from that to a whole brain interface. So a current Neuralink just has a thousand electrodes. I think ultimately it needs something which, which has, you know, probably a hundred thousand or, or a million electrodes. Now, these are very tiny electrodes. They're, they're tiny wires, way smaller than a human hair. And you know, so there's this, I, I just want to emphasize a, a long way from where you're like this today to having a whole brain interface, like, like the neural lace and the Ian Banks novels. But this is definitely physically possible. And you know, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, a human brain, which is, has a lot of constraints. They only have about maybe 10 watts of higher brain function. And we do a lot with our little 10 watts. It's not, you know, it's impressive, you know, that we've built station with such a low power computer, really. It, it, it so, is, I, I, you know, I sort of think it's like, it's, it's not bad for a bunch of monkeys, you know? And we've all watched you go from the, the Roadster to the Model 3 and Y and from Falcon 1 to Starship. So I think going from the first implants to something that's got more capacity. Oh yeah. Just a matter of, if not, a matter of when. Let's talk to- Yeah, I think I'll ultimately, sure. like I said, you'll have kind of a whole brain interface that I guess is a sort of, perhaps a form of immortality and that if it can kind of upload your brain state to, you know, if your brain state is essentially stored, you're kind of backed up on a hard drive, I suppose, then you, know, you can always restore that brain state into a biological body or, or maybe a robot or something. But I, I want to emphasize again, it's like, you know, many years in the future, I, we're not breaking any laws of physics. Like, I think this is, this is probably something that will happen. The rate of we're, we're, we're building digital superintelligence. It may just be that we'll have digital superintelligence and it'll just solve the solve the problem for us. But uh, in, in the meantime, uh, we'll keep progressing with our meat computers and uh, try to do as, do as good a job as possible. That's what I was going to say. The, uh, the tools that we have are growing at a super exponential rate that are making our linear projections of the future seem boring in some ways. Congratulations on Starship 3. Thank Amazing you. flight, just really spectacular. And we all saw uh, Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg last night, so that was great. And just, again, thankful for the work you're doing. You know, I, it's fascinating because I grew up at the late stages of the Apollo and into the, into the shuttle program, and I can't imagine that any government would be pushing space as rapidly and dramatically as you are. And so thank you for what you're doing there. That's all I can say. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the, the goal of SpaceX is, it's, it's just a, a much bigger goal than any government program, which is to rockets the spacecraft that are capable of making life multi-planetary. So, you know, I mean, step one is actually having that as a goal. If you don't have that as a goal, you're definitely not gonna achieve it. If you have it as a goal, well, now at least you have a chance of achieving it. And this, the thing about Starship is, it is the, the first rocket where Making life multiplanetary and you have, building a self-sustaining city on Mars is is at least possible. It's still obviously an immense amount of work, but it is the first rocket where that is success 
of, of, and making life multi-planetary is at least one of the possible outcomes. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're willing to venture a guess on when you'll be on the moon? I think pretty soon. I'd be surprised if, if it's longer than about three years to be landing starships on the moon. And uh, because the, the progression of starship is very rapid. You know, we're hoping to do at least another maybe five or six flights this year. And with each successive flight, making significant improvements. So I think we've got a, a decent shot of achieving full reusability of both stages, booster and the ship, this year. And if not this year, I think, you know, knock on wood, it's like, I think it's a very high probability of achieving full reusability next year, which really is the fundamental breakthrough needed to make life multi-planetary. But for those, that, for, the, yeah, for those that, 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 that don't know the rocket industry that, that well, that, that they may not be aware that, that, that this is really the holy grail of rocketry is full and rapid reusability. Because at that point, you're, you're, you're really just constrained by your propellant costs. And Starship, you know, uh, almost 80% of the propellant is liquid oxygen, which is very low cost. And then the, the fuel is met, there's sort of a little over 20% fuel, which is methane, also the lowest cost fuel. So if you have the full and rapid reusability, then your actual cost per flight of, of Starship even though it's, it'll be capable of, we think ultimately 200 tons to, to orbit, will be maybe on the two million dollars of the I can't imagine anybody who's done a better job peering into the future by actually creating the future. I'm curious, how far out do you think you're able to see? Many years out beyond today, given the speed of change. When things are changing rapidly, the, the ability to predict the future, I think, is becomes a lot hotter because of the rate of change is so great. But I think some things are fairly obvious to predict, which is that we'll have AI or AGI that's at a level that it can really do any cognitive task. That's just a question of when. One could debate, is it, you know, smarter than any even at the end of next year, or is it two years or three years? But it's not more than five years, that's for sure. So yeah, and we get like predictions, uh, predictions that I'm sort of say giving predictions of the 50th percentile of probability. So not not like it will definitely happen, but if you say what, if you ask me like, what's the 50th percentile where it's like, it would be, you know, your, your kind of over under is kind of even. That That's where I, why, why I think it's probably end of next year before AI can do better than any individual human could do. And then but there's a, it's, a, it's a much higher bar to say, well, is a swap than you know human intelligence collectively. But if the rate of change continues, that, that's why I think probably 2029 or maybe 2030 is where it, digital intelligence will probably exceed uh, all human intelligence combined. And, and there, I think it's always helpful to look at these like fundamental ratios, you know, sort of physics first principles approach. So if you look at the ratio of digital to biological compute, so like if I say all of the higher level cognitive if you sum up the higher level cognitive capacity of humans, and then what is the, and think of that as compute, then well, and then compare that to what is the digital compute. And the rate at which this is growing is just boggles the mind. You know, I think 2029 20, or 2030 or thereabouts, that's I think a reasonable time frame for where you'd expect the cumulative digital compute to probably exceed the cumulative biological compute of higher level brain functions. And then from, and, from then yeah. forever. Yeah, and still in, in, in dispatching and, and diverging forever from there. Yeah, and, and then, yeah, where do things go from there? I, I don't know, probably continues. The, we are moving from, you say, if you look at the, like the limiting factors of, you know, the, what is the constraint on growth? Like last year, it was AI chips were the constraint on growth. Then this year, the, one of the biggest constraints on, on growth are voltage step down transformers. Because, you know, the, just getting the power from like a utility at 300 kilovolts all the way down to below one volt for the computer is a massive amount of voltage step down. So it's, you know, my sort of very, very niche and perhaps not that funny joke is that we need transformers for transformers. So we need, we need voltage transformer or AI you know, neural net transformers. That, that is literally the issue this year. And then if we're saying like next year and years beyond that, it's actually just, it's going to be a, a constraints on elect, like electrical power. And you've got both AI with very big demands for electrical power and the transition to sustainable energy with electric vehicles, whatnot, also needing electrical power. So it's just a lot of electrical power needs.